How did your roster come about, Jason? The new roster? Oh yeah, I heard uh, you put in a lot of work on this one. I put in a lot of work on this one. You know, when we got our new you partners... You got it when you build a juggernaut. <laughs> yeah, the juggernaut. <laughs> Let, let's hope so. When we got our new partners in uh, 2017, you know, I promised the current lineup that we are going to give them a shot. And at the time, we could have gone out and, and just kind of reconstructed it. But we wanted to go about it the slow way. And we just didn't get the traction that we were hoping for. Even though we were at three majors in a row and got a top eight, um, it just wasn't, you know, the top five, top ten roster. That, that, that was the goal. So after we kind of crashed and, and, and burned in Berlin, I was just, I reached the end of my patience. And, um, you know, sometimes I think as a team owner or a GM, you just have to draw a line and be like, this is enough. Like, I'm going to blow it up, we're going to start over, and I want everybody, you know, who might be qualified for these positions to be aware that we're interested, we're willing to pay top dollar, and we take winning seriously. And, uh, yeah, the juggernaut tweet, um, you know, probably could have been better timed, but, uh, you know, I'm getting a little older, maybe my patience has grown <laughs> a little thin. And, you know, it, it was, a, it was a, an adventure for sure. We put in a ton of work. Um, identifying potential lineups and you know I talked to a lot of people I was trying to uh, buy old Zaiwu over here but and it wouldn't name me a price and some of the conversations I was having you know over WhatsApp and and phone um, were just not getting to where I needed them to be quickly enough as many of us know 2020 is going to be a really compelling year for Counter-Strike there's going to be more competitive teams than maybe ever before. And I wanted to make sure we have a really compelling roster locked up um, before the year's end. So there was a day I was on the phone um, with a player from Helsinki and another one from Copenhagen. Oh, and, a player from uh, Helsinki? Yes. Oh, who could it be? Uh, I wonder who. And uh, it just wasn't getting done, so I said the hell with this. I drove home from the office and threw some things in a suitcase and went to the airport and, and flew to Helsinki. And obviously, you know, spoke with Alexi B and then flew to Copenhagen and met with um, blame F and, and sometimes you'd have to do that um, you know being a GM or, or being an esports team owner I think some fans just think you sit behind a big desk all day and and and, and it's all and it's all glamour but uh, you know Counter-Strike is very important to me Counter-Strike is very important to complexity so when it was on the ropes I, I hopped on a plane and, and went over and we're happy with the team we've got we've got a young team um, I think it's got a ton of skill um, they're working really hard right now. Uh, we're going to be patient because even the great teams, the Astralis of the world and the Vitalities and some of these teams and your roster, it takes time. Um, it takes, you know, losing sometimes and, and, and overcoming adversity and, and surviving long enough to really get that team chemistry to be successful. But I'm hoping by the summer we're going to have a really, really competitive roster, and I know the guys are working hard. So it's one of the biggest challenges as a as an org and a, and a GM is, is really figuring out when to pull the plug on something yeah, right. and having that courage. Yeah. Uh, because you know, do you give them three months, six months? Do you give them a full year for them to sort of realize their full potential, uh, or do you call it quits now with all the time and investment that you've put into it, knowing that? Esports as, as a space is like, a lot of people joke with the fact that a year in esports is like five in the real world, right? right? And at, at the same time, when you put in that much effort, and whether it's salaries or time and, and whatnot, and then for, for the roster to just never succeed or live up to the expectations that, that you had to it, the fans had to it, yeah. that the roster itself had to it, it's really, uh, it's, it's such a, a difficult balance. balance yeah. act. That's a really think, good point. And I think it's very tough because when we started the team, and. Uh, uh, what I didn't touch on is that we started with Happy, uh, uh, former Glory in CS, but very quickly it was not working. But we have told the players, the coaches, like, okay, we're here to stay. We have a, a group of five that we think is the right group. So we have that stance. We firmly believe that stability is key, but you can believe that all you want at some point where your coach is telling you, we need to change. It's not that I want change for the sake of it. It's not change because in the past in CS, it was way too often player losing one tournament, not happy, uh, disagreeing with the guy, I need to change. That doesn't make a lot of sense. And that was the, what happened in CS. I think we've moved beyond that point, hopefully. Uh, but still, when your coach says, OK, it will never work with this guy. It's just yeah. not that the guy is bad. or It's just very conflicting the, the way they see the game. You have to put, pull the plug. And so we had this idea of keeping a group. And a few months after we started, boom, we do a change. But in retrospect, switching uh, happy for Alex, Oh, the other way around is a, a crazy change for us because it led us to the road to major and it's same for NBK. 
you never know, and it's very hard to take such decision. In the case of NBK, it was not about performance, but again, like very conflicting ways of seeing how the game should be played. And um, yeah, you do that decision. You know that when we did it for NBK, we know that we would got a ton of hate on social media. So I just turn off Twitter. Okay, it's good. <laughs> and it, it, you have tons of people saying you have no idea about Counter Strike. What do you know, guys? Yeah, exactly. Just ignore yeah. that. It, at some point, you feel that you need to make that decision. There's the so many examples of, of of rosters that really should have pulled the plug earlier, but but then at but the same time, the other way around. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> so hard to go. Just yeah, right. You, you see, Alexi yeah. B is like a, a centerpiece of you know a lot of controversy right now, and hopefully the ends lineup proves well. Hopefully. For for ends, the, the lineup proves to be as good, if not better, at some point. But then you also see Astralis forced into a, a roster change that they didn't ask for by by North, having Kebby suddenly leave and then Madge is coming in, and that's when they really, really take off and establish this dominance and win three majors and basically yeah. every you know been been by large and far the, big, the best team in, in 18 and 19. So it's a uh, it's definitely a difficult balance. Act. Yeah, I think it's a really good point. The timing can be difficult. And I've been accused um, by, by friends of mine being probably loyal to a fault. And for the complexity lineup, we had really good guys. And, and I believe that they could get there. And I probably waited too long. Um, and I think that's kind of where it culminated for us um, after the Berlin Major, where it, it was time to make a change. And I determined to do so loudly. And uh, we're excited for 2020. And we're going to be patient, but uh, I'm going to be conscious of the fact that if they're not getting it done after a certain amount of time, that we need to be willing to make the difficult choices and the hard changes that are necessary. That's when did when did you sorry when did you make the the decision to go international rather than stick with North American? Granted, you, you know you had you had depth and everything, but most mostly it was a predominantly North American, definitely English speaking yeah. roster, and, and suddenly yeah, for sure. we wanted the best possible team, and I didn't care where it came from. Um, I wasn't worried about, you know, three out of five for the major qualification rule. I, I didn't care. I want to build the best team that I can build. Um, I talked to Ben Ted a little bit um, over in Asia. We were talking to South Americans. We were talking to players all around the world looking for possible combinations. Um, I'm really happy with the one we have. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's difficult being a North American organization if you've got three Euros and different qualification challenges. but. Uh, I think we built the best team that we could at the time, and we're going to see where it goes. I see it, I see it as a, your North American positioning and having the training facility and stuff is on paper is great uh, because it's insane for players to have uh, that kind of infrastructure. But in real life, it's a, it's a difficulty to attract talent for a lot of Europeans. They, just don't want to move, apparently, yeah. and yeah. I, I'm sure, sure it was it, a big difficulty for you. It's absolutely difficult, and you know, I tweeted something to this effect. If the fans knew the offers that a couple of European players turned down, they'd be shocked. Yeah, We're talking signing bonuses larger than most people's annual salaries, just like throwing the world at them. But you know, you have a girlfriend, and you, mom lives down the street, and you have your friends in your life, and people don't want to relocate, and I respect that, and I understand that. Um, I was actually surprised to see you signing config because he's been someone who's been he already tr you know tried and tested with optic being in, in north america actually in frisco yeah uh and uh bought a house in denmark has a girlfriend that he's very very happy with and then for him to still take that leap you know it's yeah. it's uh, and you know why i signed him i wouldn't have signed him if if not for a couple tweets the first tweet was thorin's yeah, yeah, yeah calling yeah. him out yeah that's beautiful and he the article and he's like you know you waste your talent the way he responded to that really drew me to Christian. He he was so mature and it's just like, you know what, all this criticism is correct. Like I haven't taken advantage of the opportunities. I haven't worked hard enough and I'm gonna turn that around. You don't see when that I read that, that I was thing. like, this is a mature, hungry, passionate player that has kind of realized his, you know, missteps and his mistakes, and I believe that he's gonna turn it around. And if not for that series of events, I probably wouldn't have signed him. So it's kind of funny how that works. Yeah. <laughs> He's also one of the most talented players. Like I've, I've worked with him for two years and I always hoped, always put my egg in the, in the basket of, you know, his specific basket, knowing that he had that talent. Uh, so it's always been disappointing for him, obviously, and for myself and everyone around us to not see him, see him fully Right. Li live up to that, uh, whether that's because of the roster or his own motiva motivation or whatnot, you know, yeah. different we'll, reasons. We'll see what he does, you know, and I've told him, 
talk is fine, but you gotta you gotta walk the walk. Yeah, yeah like yeah. you can tweet Absolutely. all you want that you're gonna work hard yeah, especially and you're gonna get back, but in, you gotta go sport, out and do it. Like it's one of the the things I learned in six years in Vitality. That every player will tell you he will work. Uh, right as much as he needs to win, he will do whatever he needs to win. Every player tells you that when yep. you interview them. It's so irrelevant. Well, I've seen the same thing zero. for that paycheck. <laughs> yeah, it's a good paycheck. I mean, it's incredible. Like, 100% of a player would say that, and what, 5% would actually do it? So yeah, it's, uh, yeah we'll see. Um, I think this is a great chance for him. And I've told him, you're now one of the very highest paid players in the world. You've publicly stated that this is your comeback, if you want to call it that. Um, this is your shot. Because if you underperform here and you don't do what you say you're going to do, done. none of these teams are going to want to pay you this kind of money ever again. This is your shot, so go out and seize it. And uh, I hope he will, and I believe he will. I know uh, before the Berlin Major, you and Nate shot, I talked about you were going to attend the Major and, and, and pick up one of the top teams. So walk us through a little bit how you guys came to uh, work with the old Renegades roster. I think esports as a whole, and, and definitely Counter-Strike specifically, has gotten a lot more interesting in, in terms of how much it takes to create a roster, create a successful roster, uh, and achieving the right pieces, whether that's buying out you know, a complete roster in our case, with, which we ended up doing. Or, or putting together a brand new roster of, of star-studded talent. So we actually went through that entire process, as I, I think you, you, you did as well, where we, um, we set out back in early June, creating this giant database of all the Counter-Strike players that we could think of, uh, only leaving out all the players that we felt were unob unobtainable. So, you know, Astralis, uh, certain Liquid players, and so forth. But outside of that, we had a full database uh, complete with scouting and a lot of different metrics for every single Counter-Strike player that you can imagine. Um, and had a, a point system, rank system, if you will, uh, of how, how we valued them depending on their role, overall, and everything. Um, so for, for the longest time, our strategy was definitely to create our own roster, wanting it to be in the spirit of 100 Thieves, but also wanting to create something that... Is it true you guys looked at the OG guys? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I'll get to that. So I, I don't actually, I don't mind disclosing all of this. Um, so one thing we established pretty early on is much in line with, with how our company functions and how our fans uh, sees our company and, and the content that we put out. It was important for us to have someone that wanted to be situated in, in, in Los Angeles. And, and as Nicolas mentioned earlier, it's, it's difficult to convince European players on, you know, in general to come to the US to play, let alone um, Los Angeles. So for all its prestige and glory and everything, Counter-Strike players don't care, right? They want to play where there's the best players and the best practice and, and whatnot. Um, so, so that very early on proved uh, quite the, the problem in, in talking to a lot of players. Uh, and I'll be frank in saying we contacted players because there's no poaching regulations in place for Counter-Strike the same way there is League of Legends and whatnot. Um, we contacted anyone and everyone. Like Symbol, yeah, definitely texted him. Uh, Face Clan members, absolutely. Um, contacted anyone I could think of that I, that I would want to have working with the roster. That's going on Reddit. Um, but you know, that's... That, <laughs> I will say this, all those players are very loyal to the organizations, which I respect, and that obviously would have played in as well. Because there's also the, the stigma of players being mercenaries and such. Right. Um, and um, in general, it's very important for us to really have someone buying into our company, not buying into a paycheck, not buying into uh, being just opportunistic for the sake of you know, making money or being, you know. I didn't want players that have a the grass is always greener approach. I wanted mm. players that firmly believed in, in the lineup that they had and, and, and so forth, uh, and, and believed in, in 100 Thieves. Fast forward, we went to the major. We already had a, a few teams in mind and players in mind that we, that we really wanted to talk to. And so I think summarizing, it was down to three different prospects, one being the now Evil Geniuses lineup, former NRG lineup. Um, and there was a lot of reasons for why that was a, a very appealing lineup. And obviously, a lot of teams were, were buying for, for that specific team. Uh, and if people knew what went on behind the scenes in both negotiations and how the Counter-Strike landscape would have panned out, 
if it had gone any way different, right? It might not have been Evil Geniuses being in Counter-Strike right now. It could have been some other prestigious organization that may never enter Counter-Strike again because of it. Um, it it's, it's very interesting how those, those things pan out. Um, but we went to the major, we had all the conversations, we had great conversations with all the Evil Geniuses guys. But we also had a meeting with um, the, at the time, Renegades roster, now Hunter Thieves roster. Um, and they actually, um, they sort of blew us away in the sense that um, it was something as, and, and this might be ridiculous to a lot of people, but they said that they watched all of Nate Shot's content, they watched all of Hunter Thieves' content. They had done so for years, they were subscribed to the channels. When Hunter Thieves, before Hunter Thieves became the Hunter Thieves that we know today, but when they had a Brazilian team that never played a game, um, they actually felt like they should have been that lineup that gotten that opportunity. Rather so they than, wanted to be there. Yeah, so they wanted to be there, right? They had that passion, they had that you know drive, that fire within, and uh, that was exactly what we were looking for. Um, and they were uh, eager and willing to live in LA and um, generally speaking, were such a great group of guys that um, right off the bat, we almost couldn't wait to work with them, even though we weren't even anywhere close to negotiating with them or with Renegades for a buyout and whatnot. But we, we just knew, you know, it just clicked um, and we knew this is our guys. And um, from all the scouting we'd done, we went back to the, um, <laughs> this database of ours and we went through and we're like, well, these guys are still on an upward trajectory. And when you look into the, the results, whether, you know, they've never won championships, granted, um, but, but they're getting there. Yeah. And, and that longevity that we talked about earlier has, has really come to fruition with this lineup and they're, they're sudden, suddenly finding their magic. And we wanna be a part of that. We wanna, we wanna develop that. We wanna escalate that into to them obtaining the results that we want as an organization and they want as players. So I think this, this roster win window as a whole really came together nicely in the sense that everyone won, everyone got the, the teams that they wanted. I think Blame F is the perfect candidate for the mindset that you want to approach Counter-Strike and, and your organization with. You know, looking back, I'm happy to say it's been a win-win-win for everyone. And, I agree. Uh, yeah, we'll see in a few months who actually won. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you know. It's, it's really good insight. What, what, what was the idea <clears throat> and the intent of going public with Nature saying, hey, we'll go out on Counter-Strike? Same for you. <laughs> well, it, it's teasing. It's raising what? awareness for the players. Absolutely. Like, yeah. Yeah, but do you really need that? Because yeah, you, can, yeah. you can access them anyway. And no, it's it, you can and you can't, right? Um, I don't have the phone number of every single player, and um, quite honestly, following players on Twitter and having that be the line of communication yeah, is just not sustainable. It's not work. professional. Um, so it's it's definitely a, a way of raising awareness and having the chatter going. Mm -hmm and getting, and I'm sure Jason agrees, um, exactly right. it's just causing awareness. So while fans, you know, we got this a lot, especially in the time leading up to our announcement where like, oh, they fucked up, right? And when EG went out and announced their roster right ahead of ESL 1 New York, immediately after they signed them, people were like, oh, 100 Thieves dropped the ball. Well, no, we didn't, because we, we didn't go hardcore for that roster. We gave up pursuing that roster for a very specific reason because we had another roster that we preferred. Um, whether, you know, and we, we firmly believe that we have the right group of guys for us as a company. When, when, when Nature tweets like that, or when Jason tweets like that, it's not about appeasing fans. It's not about communicating that, hey, we're getting into Counter-Strike, you guys get excited. That's secondary. It's assuring that we can get a roster that they can get excited about. Yeah, it's very interesting because for us, when we were pursuing uh, the idea of assembling a roster, we took extra care of being super, uh, uh, doing that secretly yeah. as much as we can, because of course in the industry people would know, but yeah, not going public because of course there's a risk component where if you go out like that and then you have a tier three team, what does it do for the brand? I think it's very damaging. So yeah, we approach it uh, the, the other way, but it's a very interesting perspective. I've done it that way in the past as well. I think different circumstances and different yeah. times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. For different there was strategies. no timing, right? There was a major, there was an impending major at the time where, mm -hmm. where we do it. Um, and quite frankly, we had a lot of ideas of what we wanted. We had high ambitions. We had nothing suggesting that we would have a roster. Right, so we needed to get that chatter going. We needed to make sure that Makes sense, yeah. people were talking about it, not just Reddit, not just the casual fan. We needed players to know the in scene, their minds, yeah. hey, 
if I want to leave my team or if I want to, you know, all of these things, that's, that's a very, very apparent option for, for, for us. So that, that was, um, that was basically the idea behind it, right? It's a, it's a pretty apparent strategy and, um, yeah, it's, it's, about, it's really about casting a wide net. Yeah. Um, you want to make sure you don't leave any stone unturned. And you don't know what great players have been talking. Hey, maybe we'll leave our teams and get together, but who will we play Yeah, which for? is the way a lot Whatever. of roster assemble in a way in Counter-Strike, which is kind of a old school when you compare that to other scenes, like uh, players being friends, or I, I want to team with this guy. It's, uh, yeah. You don't see that in and other esports yeah, exactly. anymore. Exactly. Uh, Counter-Strike still has its vibe, yeah. It's a, it's a balance act trying to... Um, be diplomatic and respect the the relationship to our fellow organizations without you know I, I said earlier there's you know we can tamper all we want but we don't actually want to tamper right? right we don't want to poach players but there's also no common database that suggests when players expiration well, that, dates that are. Should, that should exist so and I'm just using simple as an example right because simple is a great player in his own right most teams would be lucky to have him and so forth and so forth and everyone knows that so for the sake of argument we don't actually know when Simple's contract expires, right? Um, we don't know what his terms are, none of that. We don't even know what his mindset is. Simple is playing for Na'Vi and that's about it. Um, so if we want to ping Simple, one of the best ways of doing that is just publicly making it very clear that there's, a, there's a, an opportunity to play here if, 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 you know, if, if that was the case. Um, and hopefully that will, and, and it did, like it, it created a, a massive amount of interest from a ton of different players and agents and, and so forth. So you've had players signed with other teams coming to you? <coughs> Absolutely. That's Absolutely. Cool. We have a, a lot of, of players that end up in different teams, whether already announced or not yet announced, that have been in, in talks with us. And part of why we have to entertain every conversation is up until the point where we have a team signed, we need to make sure that our, our business is based on the fact that we want to get in Counter-Strike, right? We, we plan our entire 2020 on entering Counter-Strike. So it's, we can't just on a whim be like, oh, if we have the opportunity, we'll do it. But if it doesn't happen, that's okay too. You know, once we decide we want to get in Counter-Strike, yeah. we're 100% committed to doing that. So yeah, when we look at 2020, when we look at our brief history in Counter-Strike, uh, we knew it would be a process. We would have to build starting from the bottom. It went faster than expected, so that's great, uh, to be able to qualify immediately for the Major and enter the Major cycle, which is so tough when you're out of it. Uh, it's very punishing in Counter-Strike, so luckily enough, like we entered the cycle, so now we're in. And so this was a, a year uh, when we were there for, to learn. And obviously, no 2020 for us is when we want to go big. Uh, we learn a ton of things in how specific Counter Strike is when it comes to player environment, the, the way uh, you have to treat the player, the way you have to connect with them, the way you have to build the team, the performance team around them. So it was really, uh, yeah, big learning experience. And now for us, we think we find the right structure around our players, the right way to. Yeah, put them in the best condition, which is, of course, what every team is looking for and will say they are doing. But for us, I really think, yeah, we find a great way to surround our player and, and put them in the right mindset. So we have very big ambition, 2020. Uh, obviously, uh, we have what I think may be the best player in the world, so that helps. And we have uh, a team that's dedicated to making function. So. Obviously, when a lot of people look at Vitality, they will say, hey, it's Zaiwu plus other players. Uh, he has the st he has an incredible stat and the other are way behind. But in a way, it makes sense because it's a system designed for him to shine, Absolutely. which is what you have to do when you have a superstar. And yeah. that's what's good with our player. They don't care about shining individually. Of course, everyone has an ego. Of course, it's not easy. But they understand that that's for the sake of the team. So at the end of the day, they don't care. And uh, if Zaiwu has the all of the MVPs and the team is winning. Everyone's fine with that. So we're in that mindset. And uh, yeah, for us, it's the year where we need to, to lift a major. So for the org and for everyone involved, that's the clear objective. So uh, one major 2020. So that's where, what we're looking for. And obviously, uh, when we talk about Blast, when we talk about next year, we want to be there for the big events, qualify for big final. We think we have the potential to do so. What we need to work on is really 
obviously consistency, which has been tough for us to, yeah, let's say uh, we have some up and down. All in all, a very good year, but it's very hard to stay. Um, you can focused. qualify, but you can't win. Yeah, uh, wh it takes what, time. What, what it's, what's interesting for us is we had that period of time where we would go to every playoff, which is very rare. And you see teams like recently EG, for example, won a, a, a championship, then uh, didn't qualify and finished dead last in the next one. That never happened to us. But we had that period where we were always going for playoffs, but not no more. And periods where we would w win tournaments and then do nothing in the next. So very tough to... What would you rather have? If you could be a constant top four? Now, of course I'd rather have inconsistency and win a major <laughs> and finish. No, but I think winning is... What yeah, winning we, is everything. Uh, yeah, because yeah, having a team that always finishes third and fourth is... What does it do for your brand? Okay, you're mm -hmm. always good, but do people right. really care? No, of course you Always the bridesmaid, never the bride. Yeah, yeah, that, that doesn't work. That, uh, winning, is, uh, winning is everything for sure. Yeah, we're really excited uh, for Blast next year. Honored to be a part of it. I think the collection of teams that are put together, I think the circuit that's being built out is really exciting. I think it's going to provide some of the best Counter-Strike anywhere in the world in 2020. Um, I think the fans are going to be in for a treat. And uh, I, I hope our team really shows up and performs like I, I believe they can. Obviously, it's going to be the best of the best, which makes it fun. I think we'll surprise some people and uh, we're really happy to, to be a part of it. And I, uh, just to that and to Blast specifically, I think that the new format we'll sing for 2020 is a great, great improvement. And uh, having this uh, group of 12 teams instead of what we had in the past, um, it was kind of limited. Of course, uh, the product itself uh, has, always been, has always been extremely exciting, but now that it's coming um, to the next level, bringing every top team in Counter-Strike, basically, uh, in, a, in a format that's so exciting for viewers. I think we're in for yeah, a great season.